I'd like to welcome to our set today Dr. Paul Gorski. Um, I consider him one of the young lines in the field today. And Paul, can you share with us a little bit about who you are, where you're at right now, what you're doing? Sure. Well, I, uh, I run an organization called EdChange, which is a kind of a loose collective of uh, social justice educators and activists who uh, do all kinds of different things together, but a big part of what we do is create uh, free educational resources for other educators and activists. Uh, and I uh, run the social justice program and minor at uh, George Mason University. Outstanding. Used your websites and materials for, for a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for your diligence and you keep creating new new websites. You want to talk about any of the new ones, the newer ones that you? Well, the one that I'm kind of excited about right now is I just did a kind of a redesign of a site called So Just, and it is a collection of historical uh, documents and literature and resources related to social justice, and I'm really focused on expanding the social justice and protest music collection. Uh, so people can go there and find songs that deal with social justice and learn a little bit about them and use them in their classes or their workshops or that sort of thing. So you have everything from, you know, from classic protest folk music to, to uh, public enemy to everything in between. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I like your work because it takes excuses away from people for not doing what they should be doing in the classroom in particular. How did you get interested in doing this kind of work? What, what drives you to be this kind of creative agent for this type of work? Well, you know, a lot of it is very selfish, you mm -hmm. know, in a way. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think about this sometimes. If I didn't get out of it, would I get out of it mm -hmm. personally, mm -hmm. spiritually? You know, would I still do it? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a big thing for a lot of white people, especially white men. Uh, that, you know, think about, you know, what, how, did, how did I end up here? Mm. I also think, you know, I grew up uh, with uh, a father who was very bigoted and uh, had to sort of make sense between that and having a kind of a diverse group of friends. And so he's saying things, not directing them at my mm. friends, but to me, they're being mm. directed at my friends. And I had a couple early mentors uh, who were men of color mm. uh, that uh, also, uh, but but you know I, I think I, I think part of it is also having a very active sense of empathy, which I've always had since I was a kid, mm. and uh, and when you match that with a sense of responsibility, I think you know that that very much drove my entry into committing my life to social justice education. Outstanding. And, and I like this notion of committing my life because that's what it has to be. Absolutely. It is a lifelong work. I know for me, I'm just retiring, and, um, but not to quit, just to move on to other landscapes and stuff. And it really, truly has been my life's work. Um, so I'm kind of interested in what you see as the landscape out there um, currently, and especially public education. And, K-12, pre-K-12 education. Um, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Do we need to just blow NCLB up? What, what, <laughs> what, what are you seeing out there? I think blowing NCLB up might be a good idea. You know, I, I, um, I think teachers are always great and always committed. And one of the first signs for me about things going awry now is that teachers are being blamed uh, for things, these folks who are public servants who give their lives are underpaid, yeah. they're underappreciated. Right. Uh, and I think this is the corporate strategy mm -hmm. for injecting more of their interests into the public schools. Uh, you know, it's classic deficit ideology. Yes. We justify oppression by pointing the, the anger at the people with the least amount of power mm -hmm. to offer any kind of counter narrative, right? It's the, it's like the, the, uh, uh, um, you know, Ronald Reagan's welfare queen kind of thing. Uh, so, I, you know, I think the landscape is scary, but, but I, I want to clarify it. I don't think it's because of the teachers. Mm. I certainly don't think it's because of parents. Mm. I think it's because uh, the corporate sector is taking over public education. And uh, I see it in just about every mm. aspect. Uh, and it's, you know, I mean, it's, this is neoliberalism. It's, mm. it's uh, public 
it's private, uh, private profiteers mm -hmm. uh, turning what is supposed to be a public space into a space for more profits. And I think, of course, like everything else, it's having the most devastating effect on the people who are already disenfranchised, people of color, low-income people, um, immigrants. So I, I, it's kind of bleak right now. I wish I could provide a counter narrative to that and say, oh no, you're totally wrong. But um, no, unfortunately, that's just not the case. Um, uh, I, I've been um, very moved by your critique of Ruby Payne and, and her work. I have worked with a lot of school districts who uh, have paid enormous amounts of money to have her training, and um, um, she definitely pushes that deficit model. I wonder if you feel free about talking about um, uh, how you, be you began your critique of her, what, what that has evolved into. I know you have a new book out, um, so maybe you can share a little bit about that book and what it's attempting to do as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I first started reading Ruby Payne's book, A Framework for Understanding Poverty, I thought it was satire. I thought this mm. can't possibly be real. Mm. And it is very difficult mm. for me to understand. In some ways, I guess it's easy to understand because she doesn't challenge us to, to think more deeply or right. complexly. And I, I think that might be the draw. But another part of me cannot understand how anyone can look at that book and think that this is an actual yeah. argument for something positive uh, because it's so full of the oldest and worst stereotypes. It's so full of factual inaccuracies. Mm. Uh, and it's been, you know, that whole thing has been quite a, well, I, I'll tell you kind of the story of what happened. What happened was I had been uh, talking with a friend about, you know, Jonathan Kozel wrote this book, Savage Inequalities, in the early 90s. And then there was kind of this gap where there wasn't really a central text around which to have conversations mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. stuff. And we were talking about that. And someone said, well, you should read this right. Ruby Payne book. And I said, OK. So I got a copy of it. And I, from the start, I was horrified. Mm -hmm. I just thought this is, you know, half of my family is Appalachian, mm -hmm. poor coal mining. Gotcha. Uh, and I just thought, this does not describe them mm -hmm. at all. This does not. This is the worst of the stereotypes mm -hmm. about them. And so from that spirit, I wrote a critique. And I, I was just incredulous. I was like, I can't, how are people buying into this? I, I literally could not understand it. And it became quite an adventure. You know, I, I got a call from her uh, lawyers. She threatened to sue me. Uh, I had a, a guy who had worked previously at the university where, where I was teaching. And he, uh, uh, his name was Bill Summers. And he started uh, harassing me about, about it. And uh, I think that's attached to the corporate piece. Mm -hmm. Ruby Payne is a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she's not an education reformer. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's not. A, she's certainly not a social justice person, mm -hmm. uh, and she makes millions of dollars. Amazing. Millions of dollars off uh, peddling this yeah. stuff and on poor people. There, there are districts that have paid her hundreds of thousands Absolutely. of dollars, yeah. and, and it's unreal. It's yeah. unreal. And there's no evidence to show that what she does right. is helping. Right. Uh, so it's it's really, it's really unreal. I'm still incredulous about yeah. it. You know. Yeah. Um, but I think it also speaks to what people want to hear I, and, absolutely. and so that coincides with we know we need to do something so what should we do well let's maintain these deficit notions and, and we we see these as you've said you know all all across the the, uh, uh, the whole hierarchy of public education and they are indeed very dangerous uh, I wonder if you could give some examples so our audience here can um, get an idea of exactly what you're talking about when you, when, um, you, when you provide this critique of, of her work. Well, I think the important thing is to understand deficit, the deficit yeah. model, uh, uh, because that's at the root. Of, yes. I mean, there are a lot of very basic things. One is just that what her work is just inaccurate, mm. and so for that reason it should be mm -hmm. dismissed in and of itself. But the, the deficit model is a model that uh, identifies the problem that needs to be fixed in the most powerless group of people. So the, the deficit model would say, okay, why are low-income students not doing as well in schools? Well, 
um, the deficit model says, well, it must be their culture. We need to fix poor people. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can also think about these, like the very popular stuff that was also spun off of her work, the, uh, the circles model of ending poverty, which is how do you end poverty? Well, you surround individual poor people with middle class people. Mm -hmm. So we change the poor people. Mm. So it's not about living wage work. It's not right. about affordable right. housing, right. affordable child care, mm. equitable education. Mm. It's about how do we fix yeah. the ethics and morals of poor people. Um, and uh, the problem is, when how, whatever we define as the problem, that's where we're going to focus when we start working on solutions. Mm -hmm. right? So if we think the problem is poor families, then the solution we focus on in education is not about creating equitable educational opportunity, uh -huh. which is what we ought to be focusing uh -huh. on. It's about how do we fix poor people. And uh, that's the model that she, that she draws on. And you can see that throughout her, uh, around class, but also around race uh, throughout her book. Her work's very racist as well as mm -hmm. having the, the class bias in there. So there are things like talking about poor people don't care about, don't value education, mm -hmm. uh, which research shows is ac absolutely wrong. Yeah, uh, that uh, poor, Poor women are promiscuous. Poor men are are uh, abusers. She talks about poor people being substance abusers mm. when actually wealthy people are more likely to be mm. substance abusers mm. than poor people. Uh, she totally flubs up uh, the language, talking about uh, uh, the formal register versus informal mm. register and, and mm. all of those sorts of things. So it's just thing after thing of inaccuracy, but the most dangerous thing is that the inaccuracies are feeding stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And there have been a couple of studies that show that people who go through, who read her book or go through her workshops, actually come out with more stereotypes than they had mm -hmm. before they before went they in. Went so. In. Yeah. Um, so how do we create a counter-narrative to her work? Then? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm working on, actually I just, uh, I have a book in press right now about this. I'm working on uh, a model that I'm calling equity literacy. This is what I'm talking about tomorrow, where we reframe the whole conversation. So instead of it being framed around culture, mm. the whole thing around culture, because I think that makes it really easy to slip into mm. the deficit ideology. Right. So we don't build the conversation around culture, we build it around equity. So the question is not just, do I understand the cultures of my students, which is of course important, uh, also problematic in some ways, because then you have, you know, all I have to know is what is African American culture, and all of a sudden I can teach all African American right. people. Yeah. But uh, uh, so instead of doing that, focus on equity. Can I recognize inequity when it even very subtle forms mm -hmm. of inequity? Mm -hmm. Do I know how to respond to inequity? Do I know how to redress inequity long term yeah. stuff? So it's kind of shifting the focus so that it's on addressing the opportunity gap instead of uh, identifying the culture as the problem. Right. Yeah, I, and one would think that that should be easy um, for people <laughs> to get at. You know, when you look at the wealth inequality in this country, it's mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. Um, um, I, I use a lot of the census data in my work because it, it's so revealing, but but you have to be able to deconstruct it, and and I think sometimes that's what's not happening in mm. in K twelve. It, it it seems to me that they're not getting that in their teacher preparation. There's not enough of that critical inquiry uh, in their preparation. Um, so they so they go to work with these master narratives well fixed and well positioned in how they see the students, how they see community, how they see, you know, uh, the role of public education. Um, so, yeah, we, we need to be able to challenge, you know, those narratives and provide some counter narratives, Absolutely. you know, to that. Um, so, yeah, I'm ex excited about uh, the potential of this, of this new work to help provide that. How are you going to get it into public education? Though? How are you going to get it into teacher education? You have ideas about how to do that. How do we get the academy to begin to accept um, a bigger role in making sure our teachers have critical theory? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of scared about that too because of this new, the NCATE merger yeah, and, yeah. and all of that. And a lot of that is driven by NCATE and yeah. colleges of teacher ed programs are are scared of, in, mm -hmm. of, of, mm -hmm. of the accreditation mm -hmm. process. And mm -hmm. so, and the accreditation process is pushing us into preparing technicians. Yes. And that's the whole problem. Yeah. That's the whole problem. It's why teacher education is mocked in other areas of higher education, uh, which is a tragedy. It's yeah, it a is. tragedy. It really is. Uh, so, you know, so I think it's pushing back against, uh, against that, the accreditation models. Uh, I think it's about organizing to organizing to push back against um, against that, uh, and I, I think it's about doing a lot of educating. It's about getting getting the the tools into people's hands, and and helping them uh, uh, understand. You know, a lot of people teaching in teacher ed. You know, they went through those same programs. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and I think it's about us as teacher educators seeing our students as scholars, as people who absolutely. can handle complex yeah. theory and then apply that to practice yeah. uh, instead of, you know, this semester you're going to write three two-page reflection papers and that's going to be your whole. Exactly. Uh, so. I, I do a lot of work with educational leadership and educational leadership, so working with principals and superintendents and I am always amazed at how little they have read in critical theory. Mm. So when you bring up a Henry Giroux, you know, a Paul Freire, they've never heard of these people, mm. okay? Um, so I'm gonna ask you the same question, okay? So obviously if we need to be doing this with K-12 teachers, pre-K-12 teachers, then how do we do this with the educational leaders? How do we get them to become um, more red, more wide red, and especially in those who critique the system, not just go along with the system. Again, challenging that master narrative that we see so prevalent in, pub in public That's spirit. a great question. You know, it's a tough thing too because that kind of thinking is not rewarded mm -hmm. on the track toward mm -hmm. ed leader to mm -hmm. principal positions or mm -hmm. superintendent positions, uh, especially because of such a focus on high stakes testing. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, critical analysis is not rewarded on that no. track. Uh, so part of it is changing that track, you mm -hmm. know, and part of it is starting when people are in their teacher ed programs and putting the seed uh, in there. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why I and, I, and I wish, you know, my colleagues, including Henry and Peter and, uh, um, uh, Antonio Darder and, and folks, I, I wish they did a little more of, you know, that's what, you know, so everything, every time I write something for a scholarly journal or something, I always write something around the same topic for a magazine. Hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll write it for Rethinking Schools, I'll write sure, it for sure. Teaching Tolerance, right, right. Capin, yeah. you know, wherever, because, you know, the average middle school principal or district superintendent is not reading teachers college no, record you yeah. know so i think part of it is is uh, that and me being able to uh, you know not insisting on on using language that's really a kind of a critical theory speak academic language that isn't the language of most mm. practitioners mm. I mean, we can use that language and still pick up the mm -hmm. practitioners mm -hmm. who are interested mm -hmm. in it. But the people who have a little bit of critical mm -hmm. consciousness but never learn the language or yeah. don't even, don't call it critical theory right, right, just because right. it's not their framework. Right. You know, the, the people who are community activists, you know, they don't, they don't give a damn about teacher's college record right. or Harvard Ed Review or anything right. like that. You know, so, so how do we pull them into the conversation? Yeah. I think we need a primer. Um, a you know, primer would be good. You yeah. know, something that's very accessible to them um, that begins to give them that language and, and then nudges them toward reading, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, more sophisticated work. Um, Giroux can be challenging, at, you know, if you haven't read at that, that level, let's mm -hmm. face it. Um, his, his language is definitely complex. and. As my uh, students tell me, 
I had to get my dictionary out. I said, really? <laughs> really? Good. What a novel thing, yeah. you know, that you had to learn new words, you yeah. know. <laughs> but, but I also understand their dilemma, and their dilemma is, they're jumping through all these hoops with NCLB. When do I find that quality time to read at that depth and level, and then how do I, how do I apply it? You know, given the nature of the high stakes testing we're talking about, and that becoming increasingly more problematic because so many things are going to depend upon those scores. Um, it's scary. It's really daunting. I'm in fear, you know. See, and I want people to read Life in Schools, and I want people to read, you know, uh, Giraud's work, and, yeah. and I want them to read that in its right. form in those yes. books and articles. Uh, but I want a bridge, you know, some people just need a bridge to yes. that, a little, uh, a bridge. And so, so I try to provide those bridges uh, whenever I can by, by publishing in more popular magazines uh, that, that I know. So I know my work is not going to be surrounded by critical work in those magazines, but it at least might give that high school principal say, mm, maybe I should read a little bit more of this person's work. And, and, well, th that's my retirement plan, is to uh, <laughs> work with um, principal associations, superintendent associations, and, and really try to get them to begin, you know, reading more critically. Um, because I, if they don't have those query skills, you know, how can they really um, understand that public thing that we were talking about and that corporate thing that we were talking about? How do they have the skills to then deconstruct those narratives that are coming from those places? Oh, it's so important. I mean, yeah. especially now because the, the popular discourse around equity right now is focused on the test scores. Exactly. And people don't realize that framing itself has sucked us right into the yeah. core of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So like I, I, just a few years ago, I went to this equity education conference in Phoenix. And it just seemed like every conversation people were having is how to raise test scores. How do we raise yeah. the test scores of African American male mm -hmm. students? How do we raise the test scores of English language learners? Right. You know, that, that sort of thing. And I just thought the whole framework we're using for this mm -hmm. conversation means that we're not going to make progress mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. because the obsession with the test scores is, you know, that's what we're meant to trip into. Right. So what we ought to be doing is asking ourselves. How did we get sucked into being obsessed with these test scores? And what does that really have to do with equity at the end of the day? Right. And, and we know what the response has been in places like Atlanta, you know, where they know their jobs are on the line. And so you start getting people changing scores, mm -hmm. okay, and, and stuff. And you can begin to understand why they do that. I yeah. mean, especially if you have large populations of quote unquote at risk children, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and that happened in D.C., where, yeah. where I'm from. Yeah. And so, and then, and then of course, we also produced uh, Michelle Rhee, uh, who, who was kind of emblematic of a lot of the problems we're discussing. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've talked about teachers. We've talked about administrators now. Let's talk about the students. Okay. okay? Um, so the question is, um, one, I find K-12s to be one of the least democratic frameworks that exist in a country that's supposed to be about preparing young people for living in a democracy. So, so how, do we, how do we change that? How do we help schools become more democratic? How do we help young people also develop that ability to do that kind of inquiry that they need, that, um, that critical um, analysis that they need to be able to, you know, circumvent mm. some of the nonsense that they're facing, especially in the social media. You know, how do we help them develop those filters for saying, this is trash, I should maybe pay attention here, um, this is where I really need to focus. Yeah, the development of critical literacy and right. media literacy and, and these sorts of things. You know, and I, I think it goes back to the same thing, you know, I think part of the corporate influence has been the, the uh, dis has led to the disappearance of a lot of pockets of that that were already happening, and you know I, maybe I'm a little cynical, but part of me thinks that is kind of purposeful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there is a lot of profiting to do off of an uh, an uncritical 
uh, populace. And so just to think critically about how I get sucked into consumer culture and spending a bunch of money on things I don't need and mm. thinking every season I have to buy a whole new wardrobe and, and all, you know, that just a like constant, uh, we go to war and then you have the president saying you can help by going shopping. And, yeah. And, you know, it's just it's completely nuts. Strange but, combination. But, I, you know, I think it goes back to preparing teachers mm -hmm. to do that, to, to engage students in, in that way. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's also getting over this idea that the students aren't ready, that they're too young. Mm -hmm. and, and I just have never found that. I, I go into kindergarten classes and talk about racism. I mean, they might not have language like mm -hmm. white privilege or systemic racism or intersectionality right, or whatever, right. but they know that's not fair. You mm -hmm. know, that mm -hmm. usually kids have a real sense of justice. Mm -hmm. They do. Right? And, and, yeah. it's like, and it's like the adults beat it out of them right, you know, right. somehow. So, but they can do it, and, and there are lots of good resources to, to help with that if, if we have the courage uh, to do it. But, but again, you know, I, I don't want to blame teachers again for not doing it because mm. they're not rewarded for that. Right. Teachers get punished for doing that kind of thing nowadays. And it's really senseless because we have these schools that have these mission statements, like you said, preparing youth to participate yes. actively in a democracy, and then and then we don't teach them about right the draconian yeah. <laughs> leadership models and you know we don't building. teach them about about the the very basic barriers to to authentic democracy mm -hmm. that exist and yeah. and how to contribute to overcoming those and, and as soon as you said phoenix i had to think tucson you know i'm, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of yes. that insanity going on there but but again there's this classic example of of these power brokers who are pushing this master narrative uh, and 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 really, you know, dismantling good programs that were making a difference for this Hispanic population, this Absolutely. Latino Latino population, and stuff. And you and you begin to go, what is that about? Why would you do that? You know, why would you Decrease ever? Decrease dropout rates. Right, right. Better engagement, better grades. Hey, let's cancel this program. Yeah, yeah well, it doesn't. Just, we don't want that. Yeah, you know. it makes no sense. Uh, unless um, it's because I can profit from you know doing this, I can get myself elected to a, a higher office, I can become more powerful within the state, I can push these agendas of fear, and um, you know, um, you know, so you know, you, you hate again to want to think that this is planned and premeditated, but. Yeah, sure. Sometimes it's hard sure not to believe that. Sure, seems yeah. like it, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, um, and and again, especially in a state that's already um, minority majority. Right. Okay, and they're looking down the road, saying, you know, the future of this state is going to be with these these brown people. Okay, and so do we want them educated? Do we really want them literate? Do we really want them with critical, you know, inquiry skills? I don't know. Maybe the answer is no. Mm. Now, is that me being cynical? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that that I, you look at what the situation is and name name what's there to name. You know, I, I don't know that that's. You know, every time I think I, I'm being cynical, then something comes up and reminds me. You know, yeah. for-profit prisons and judges getting paid off to send kids to to prison. You know that the whole privatization of the prison uh, network and, and all of that sort of thing. And you just think, uh, you know, and, and you know, the, the new legislation to protect Monsanto, which is like mm -hmm. the biggest human rights abuser mm -hmm. in the entire world, yeah. uh, not to mention environmental abuser and animal abuser, and uh, protecting them. And so it's hard not to say that uh, it's, it's hard to say, no, that's not being cynical, yeah, that's yeah. naming what is there to name. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I opened a piece by calling you one of the young lions <laughs> in this, you know, and I know that's always dangerous to do that kind of thing, but, uh, um, but you know, I, I've been in this work for a long time, you know, 35 years, and when I look back to the 70s in which that was my, you know, coming of age era and um, the work that we've done since, um, so, what is it for you looking down the road here now, okay? 
what, what do you want to accomplish when you want to look back at retirement years? What do you hope that you have contributed and, and done to make this a better country, a better educational system? Wow, that's a big question. Oh, yeah. You know, what I'm really interested in is pulling people from different movements uh, who have the same core values, uh, who have the same concerns about, mm. about um, systemic injustice, mm. uh, pulling them together uh, so that we're not competing for resources and, and uh, that sort of thing, like the environmental movement, which is in many ways a racial justice movement. Yeah. The whole environmental justice framework was created by a committee of people of color mm -hmm. uh, who are recognizing, mm -hmm. hey, why are all the toxic waste dumps going <laughs> yeah. in our backyards? Yeah. You know? uh, Sadly. And uh, so h how do we take people who are working on an issue like that and people who are working on an issue like factory farming mm -hmm. that, that also has the worst devastating effects mm -hmm. on people of color, indigenous communities, sure. poor people, uh, people who are working on economic justice issues, people who are working on education justice issues, uh, and, and find the commonalities in our movements uh, so, that, uh, so that, you know, we can make all those movements stronger. So that's really what I'm trying to work on now is that, the other thing I'm trying to work on is, um, you know, I, I Maybe this is just about me becoming more mature, but in, in some ways, for a long time, I was kind of a, maverick's not the right word, but I, I did a lot of activism on my own. Mm. I didn't do a lot of collaboration. Mm. I was really, um, well, you know, how the, the critical set can get, mm -hmm. you know. Just, sure, sure. Uh, and I really want to build more community mm. in activist movements. And I'm not talking about fluffy, let's all join hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm talking about strengthening the movement mm. um, by, by, uh, by pulling people together and, and giving us tools to deal with things like burnout, yeah. um, deal with things like uh, uh, dealing with resistance and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I'm kind of working on that as well. I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that's really, really important because it, it seems to me in this post-civil rights kind of era that we find ourselves in um, that a, a, a lot of the coalitions that were there in the 60s and 70s that you know were built on the back of those movements coming from 30s, 40s, whatever, um, either have kind of stalled um, some have morphed slightly uh, um, and stuff. It, the women's movement is a great example of it uh, and stuff that, you know, was so dynamic and powerful. Now it seems to have splintered in, in, in so many different directions. Um, and, you know, that basic, basic civil rights movement has too um, and stuff. So this notion of how do we re-energize um, those movements and those populations to continue to do the work um, is, is, is a very powerful notion and idea and one that really has merit. So I'm hoping you can find ways to do that. It, and it, it seems that um, you have been successful at using social media to, to accomplish some of that. Do you see that continuing? Is that going to be one of the strategies that you employ to try to make this happen? I think it's I think it's one strategy, and and I think I've 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 been able to do some pretty decent organizing using social media. I think also though I think part of the problem with social media is a lot of people think if I just click on this change.org um, thing mm. and add my name to this list, yeah. then that makes me an activist. Right. And so I think that you know I I also think it's getting in the way a little bit that I can't be an activist just on Facebook. Mm. And I, I think a lot of young people are looking at themselves that way. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's a way to organize people so that we can come together in person. It's like a lot of things, you know, it reminds me of the like uh, intergroup dialogue programs or like mm -hmm. the, the caucus dialogues where you have the white caucus group meeting together right, and the right. people of color caucus group. And I always thought, okay, this is a neat thing, but a lot of people will think that the discussion itself 
is the change. Right. And I was like, no, the discussion is what prepares us to, for the change. Exactly. And I think it's the same with, with social media. It's what, it's what can help us find each other uh, and share some strategies and some resources, but just that exchange isn't, isn't mm. is pretty useless unless mm -hmm. we're channeling it into something. Well, and I think, unfortunately, we're getting some real powerful live examples of that. Egypt comes to mind, yes. you know, where you, you have this revolution that was, you know, partially powered by social media, but the footwork wasn't done to make sure you had a democratic result and instead of replacing one you know despot with another kind of of despot and 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 it seems to me that's the work that has to be done on the ground that's where mm. the foot soldiers have have Absolutely. to be yeah um, so that's a curious question then is how do we move people to action um, and not just sit back with their controllers and play video games. <laughs> I, I've really noticed this with young people who mm. I work with today. Now, I, you know, I've been doing this stuff for about 20 years, mm. and one of the differences I see is that now I think a lot of youth think about social media as their form of activism. Right. A lot of them also confuse celebrating diversity with something that's transformational. Mm. So they're sort of entry point into, mm. you know, it's not racial justice, it's racial harmony. Mm. And so the conversation is very different. Mm. And, and I find when I'm in a, in a group of youth who are all very committed to racial harmony, they have a really difficult time making the transition to racial justice. Uh, uh, even youth of color mm. uh, a lot of times have a diff difficulty doing that. So I think that's another thing to, you know, a lot, I think a lot of schools are doing the celebrating diversity mm -hmm. and the mix it up at lunch day mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the, that sort of thing. Um, but. Um, think so there's a lot of there's still not enough even of, of kind of the racial harmony but sure. but uh, what seems to be almost completely gone is the racial justice mm. mentality uh, and same can, can a you, lot of can you issues. can you get a feel for what happened I mean why did that become secondary or tertiary now you know I think that uh, I think because a lot of the work that's done in schools is the very fluffy taco night and international food <laughs> fair and multicultural yeah. festival right. and right, right. and um, and that sort of thing and and I think youth kind of have grown accustomed to that mm -hmm. and are not accustomed to having conversations about difficult issues uh, and I think they can and I think mm -hmm. they desperately want to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and uh, you know they always when when I go in and and have the conversation they're always great much better than adults because. They're just more open about mm. it, you know. Um, but uh, uh, I just, you know, because that piece about democracy is not really in schools, and I mean, look at how we teach Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. I have a dream. Right. It's like the fluffiest thing he ever said yeah. in his entire life, right. and that's the whole legacy that's, that's left. That's you it. know, nobody's talking about right. the poor people's. March. The, nobody's talking about his criticism of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Nobody's talking about mm -hmm. how he's connecting these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. Uh, it's kind of a they get commoditized. It's that's it, exactly it seems, right. That's yeah. exactly right. And um, so it and and it's always you know feeding back to the narrative again. And we were talking about that earlier, and that that seems to be the real challenge. Is you know, how do we establish these counter narratives um, that reveal, I think, um, the inadequacies that, that are taking place? And I, I just think it's really, really different and really difficult mm. when you've got this huge, you know, materialistic machine out there that's saying, don't pay attention to this. Pay attention to, don't you want a new car? Yes. <laughs> you know, don't you want to go on vacation? Don't you want to take this cruise? Um, and, and, and that's where we go back to, you know, the schools once again, to, you know, they've got to help young people, you know, develop the, that critical ability to see through, you know, that ruse, you know, to see through that facade and, and, and see that, you know, community still is going to be what's necessary for survival. Absolutely. Um, and not just community, i.e. within 
the United States, but now, you know, certainly global community. Global community, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you reminded me of my eighth grade English teacher because uh, the, here's the one thing I remember from eighth grade, mm -hmm. other than being completely awkward as an eighth grader. Uh, eighth grade, first day of English class, uh, American literature textbook, very first day of class, here's what we did. The teacher, uh, my teacher said, okay, I want everyone to turn to the table of contents and I want you to look at who's listed there and think mm -hmm. about who's not listed there. Mm -hmm. a, that's how she started the entire school year. Beautiful. It's brilliant. It's Beautiful. not radical. Right. It's, not, uh, it's not hard pedagogically. Yeah. Right. It's, it's very basic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that set the stage for a whole year's worth of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. There's just one little thing like that. Yeah. It's just brilliant. Yeah. And, and again, as I think we both agree, um, that type of teaching is scarce now. Un unless you're at a magnet or a charter that has a little bit more flexibility and you're dealing with students who are a little bit better prepared, um, they're not worried about them taking those exams and scoring well. So I can be more creative, I can be more innovative in the, in the classroom. But if, if I'm working with other populations where I know the students are going to be challenged and giving the scores necessary for us to be funded, for us to keep our teachers, you know, to not be taken over by the state, um, I, I, I can't do that. Mm. Um, and, and that's what I'm hearing when I talk to teachers out there in the field and they're saying, you know, I, we like what you have to say, but I've got to deliver these scores or I'm in trouble. Mm. You know, so, okay, young lion. Um, <laughs> how do we how do we change that? You know how do we, how do we get through that? You know we need to return to teaching. I mean, what really teaching and learning really should be about? Well, I think it's about wrestling control of public education back uh, away from corporate yeah. interests. I, I think that's pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and then the question is how to do that. Right. You know, one thing that we should recognize is that there are teachers in a lot of places, Seattle, Chicago, who are deciding they're not gonna do this anymore. That they know that this is like child abuse, right. the, the, these yeah. high stakes tests. Yeah. Uh, and they're just like, we're not going to yeah. do this anymore. Yeah. We're not gonna support right. it anymore. Right. Anything we could do to support them and to uh, try to learn from what they're doing and. Mm -hmm how to apply it in other places, I, I, I think is, is huge, is huge. And, and the difficult thing right now is that I think a lot of teachers feel a little disempowered because their, their creativity has been taken away, their professionalism yes. has been taken away. So anything you know, we could do to, you know, especially those of us who are preparing teachers mm -hmm. or preparing mm -hmm. school leaders to, to um, kind of rediscover their power I, you know, I, I think is a huge thing. Yeah. Have you worked with unions, um, teacher unions? I, mean, I have a little bit, not, little bit. not extensively. Yeah. But what do you think they can ally with us in this kind of change? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, th I think the teachers unions are huge. And I, I think one of the things also we need to do is to protect uh, to protect the unions. They are being attacked. They're under assault. And again, yeah. you know, think about who benefits the most Once again, from that, and it goes we, right back. It goes to the, right back. Yeah, to yeah, the same. Without a doubt. So, uh, so definitely, definitely the teachers' unions, but also, I think um, those of us who are in higher ed, who might have a little bit more protection uh, than than the teachers' unions. I think helping to protect the teachers' unions, mm -hmm. too, however we can, is a is important. Yeah. If we can't do it in teacher preparation, can we do it through professional development? I think we can to some extent. The, the difficulty is that um, the schools are deciding who's coming in to do their professional development. Yeah. So, you know, I think my experience has been it's, it's more about organizing, you know, it's finding the teachers, even if it's, a, if it's a small group who want to be part of pushing back um, and then building from there. And I was able to do that a little bit in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, starting to do it a little bit in the DC metro area where I have a started what we're calling a social justice friends group. Mm -hmm. And so it's people from local school districts, teachers, 
from preschool teachers all the way up to teacher educators mm -hmm. who are kind of organizing mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to work on some of these issues and how to deal with the predominance of Teach for America in the D.C. area and all of that sort of thing. So that kind of organizing, I think, is important. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and once again, what's it sound like? It sounds like back to the grassroots. Absolutely. Um, which has always been the strength of change, you know, in, in this nation's history and probably in most countries. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's what it feels like to me is that we've lost some of that. So we've got to find ways to, to get that building again. And, and young people have to be part of the answer to that. Um, right. So. I don't know, that primer, I think, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, and the scary thing about it is you go to places like Wisconsin, which historically has been such a strong union right. state, labor yes. rights yes. state, and I think this goes back to the lack of critical education. So you have people who, um, that had that history mm -hmm. um, and in a sense have been kind of mm -hmm. re-educated mm -hmm. or reprogrammed mm -hmm. um, to, to disassociate from or critique yeah. this thing that for generations before them was central to the culture. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's a really scary It is a very event. scary thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think doing some of that community education, working with rather than working on hmm. local communities and community hmm. activists, uh, I, I think is huge. Yeah. Yeah, I like the model that you talked about that you're, you know, experimenting with in Washington, D.C. Um, it, it seems to me we need something like that kind of across the country in terms of building those coalitions again and uh, of interest and in bringing like-minded people together. Um, so if that's part of your legacy here um, for the future and stuff, that sounds like a, like a, a, a very good one. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, we've got a few minutes left. And so, I always like to give people a chance to wax wide, okay? <laughs> so, so g give me your best shot for um, what we need to do in the next five years to begin to turn the corner on this, to begin to um, create that kind of critical mass that we're talking about that brings the grassroots back into play. Um, how are you going to contribute to doing that? What's what's the steps we need to be thinking about and in, in investing in? Well, I think we need to take take the schools back, you know, and I think the the best way to do that is to work with uh, work with local communities. They know their communities best. They know their schools best. They know their kids best. Mm. Uh, you know, so uh, I think part of the challenge we're also up against is this big separation between academia, between kind of the public face mm -hmm. of activism, which too often is an academic face and right. not a grassroots right. face, uh, and then local communities and community activists. Uh, so, you know, I think it's really important, and I've tried to do this through Ed Change and through the Social Justice Friends Network to build those bridges and make the relationships authentic. Uh, because as I'm sure you know, what too often happens is, well, here's the academic from the university, and uh, she or he is going to go in and fix the community mm. and tell them what their mm. problems are mm. and tell them how to fix their problems, mm. which is why a lot of mm. those folks don't want people from the university in their mm. communities. So uh, how do we, how do we uh, create kind of equal relationships there? Uh, uh, am I willing to stand up for instead of standing in front of, mm. uh, speak with rather than mm. speaking for uh, uh, people in local communities. And I think if we don't do that, if we don't do that, uh, then it's going to be perceived largely as, as an academic critique yeah. and that's meaningless for most people. Uh, so I think uh, building those uh, and being willing to be, for me, it's about being willing to be in service of those movements, mm -hmm. not being involved only when I'm getting accolades for it, uh, I'm in the public eye for it. Uh, I think that's too often what goes on in, in academia, and that's why you know so many people don't trust mm 
mm. what we're about. So that's what I think it's about, genuine uh, relationships. And then it's about learning from each other. Mm. The, uh, and then it's about getting at the root of the issue, mm -hmm. not mitigating injustice, right, right, right. eliminating injustice. Right, right. So there we have to take neoliberalism into consideration. There we need to take bigger systems into consideration. And, right. And, figure it out. and if we can't get at school funding, we're in desperate trouble. Exactly. I mean, it's just you know, exactly. really pretty, pretty blatant and pretty, pretty clear. Absolutely. You know, in those regards. So, okay, young lion. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing, and um, I think there was a lot of very solid ideas that um, that we talked about here, and um, I, I think a, a, a nice construction of uh, marching plans. Uh, for the future there. So I want to thank you for your time and uh, for, your, uh, for your heart here because I, I felt that. Uh, and, and that's um, what a good activist has to be driven by is, is by their heart engaged with their mind. So appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Yeah. I look forward that's to great. marching with you. Okay, this, there you go. This movement. All right. Outstanding.